Welcome to the On Your Mind podcast, where we are changing the mental health narrative, bringing hope and solutions. Here's your host, Timothy J. Hayes, psychologist. Beatrice Birch is the founder, ED, and director of the therapeutic program of the Inner Fire Proactive Healing Community in Vermont. She has worked as a Huska artistic therapist for more than 30 years in integrative clinics and in inspiring initiatives in England, Holland, and the United States, where the whole human being of body, soul, and spirit was recognized and embraced in the healing process. She has lectured and taught as far afield as Taiwan. Her passionate belief in both the creative spirit within everyone and the importance of choice, along with her love and interest in the human being, has taken her also into prisons where she has volunteered for many years offering soul support through alternatives to violence work and watercolor painting. Please note, Beatrice was first interviewed for the On Your Mind podcast, and it was published on April 7th, 2020. Please reference that for more information about the Interfire Proactive Healing Community. As in this episode, we will focus more on Beatrice as a therapist and her philosophy of dealing with the whole human being. Well, Beatrice, thank you so much for being here. It's delightful to see you again. It's a pleasure to be back meeting with you, Tim. I appreciate it very much also. I I was just noticing in preparing for this second interview that our, our first interview with you published, I think it was sometime in April of 2020. So our listeners can go back there and find out more about the layout of Inner Fire and kind of the overview of your program. And I was hoping you could share with us more uh, in this talk, your philosophy of the person and how, how we develop our struggles and how we resolve them and, and just take us on a little bit of a journey into, into your mind and how you work with people. For sure. For sure. Um, Tim, have you ever heard the expression, We are spiritual beings having an earthly experience. Yes. (laughs) I think that fairly simply sums it up. And I think, you know, I was, you know, I wonder sometimes how do we get, how did we get to where we are now? Where we're treating human beings fairly inhumanely. And I, you know, when I think, I think our greatest challenge today is the view of the human being. And as materialism has strengthened, we forget to recognize that the human being is actually a spiritual being. And we have parts of ourselves that are physical. Of course, we have our physical body, but we all know we have our soul, which is uh, the source of our, the home of our feelings, our sympathies and antipathies. And, you know, and then we have a part of ourselves that has, we we know this that that is never um, never wounded. You know, there's a part of us that is wounded. We have you know you can see it in different ways. There's we have the fourfold human being, which is our well the threefold. Let's start with the threefold. We have our physical body, we have a soul, and we have a spirit. And now this then the fourfold is the physical body, and the soul consists of an etheric, a life body, which is strengthened by when there is rhythm and order in our life. It's where our memories live, you could say. And we have our astral body. And many cultures are aware of this. We've lost it fairly in this country, in Western Europe, Western part of the world. And, um, and then we have our astral body, which is the, the home of our sympathy and antipathy. And then we have another part of ourself, which I would say is the part that reincarnates, that comes time and again, which is the part that's the witness. I refer to it as the charioteer, the higher self, however you want to see. But but that, um, you know, we know we have feelings, but we know that we are more than our feelings. And that's the part of us that's more than our feelings. And I think... You know, when we think of what we're doing to people of all ages these days where, um, you know, they're, well, 
the suicidal rate has gone up, as has the use of the psychotropic medications for all ages. And it doesn't take much imagination to wonder if there's a link between all of that. And typically our psychotropic medications and also the other substances that people, the street drugs and so on that people use, they disconnect our body, soul, and spirit. You know, so that's why so many people will will cut themselves, Tim, wondering because the meds disconnect us from our feelings. People say, I feel zombified. I, I can't think clearly. I can't feel. I'm not able to do anything. And so they wonder, well, will I feel my, feel anything if I cut myself? You know, and so what we're doing through these psychotropic medications is really causing chaos within the human body-soul relationship and therefore through the spirit. And that's really how we work at Inner Fire is at the, and how I just meet people and work with people as whole human beings. And I presented in Rotterdam a couple of years ago and the theme, this I found is very interesting. I thought, well, I've got nothing to lose, you know? And the theme of my presentation was suppose mental health is a reductionist term for soul health. And Tim, the room was packed. I think people are so thirsty. What I'm saying actually is not particularly profound. It's not rocket science. I think a lot of people in their hearts know this and they know that we're all living crazy fast lives where there's no time to pause and think, no time to feel. Plus, if I feel, what am I going to do about it? You know, and that's where we help to really empower people is have your feelings and then choose. It's your freedom. What are you going to do about it? Well, so, you know, what I'm hearing you say resonates so much with the work I do with people. And I interviewed a, a gentleman who's a retired politician in Australia, and he was just he's beside himself at the pattern that's emerging in Australia, which is one that's born out of this medical model that says we're just machines. And so if you get the right component parts in the right balance, then, you know, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, you're off and, and here, here's another prescription, here's another. And they've got a lot of people they have to try and service and they're doing it with, you know, the, the national um, medical system. And so they found the most efficient way they could to get people seen. Well, that is have them be seen by their primary care physician and they'll get a 15 minute or a half an hour session and this generalist will determine what's needed and and because of that it if you're thinking about an assembly line and you have to process millions of people it's a very efficient system yeah. but if you think that we are just the physical and we just need to add a little bit of that you know chemical vitamin c and vitamin d and maybe a little bit of um Adderall or whatever the stimulant medication is, and then we'll be better, then that makes really good sense. But when you understand what you were just saying, this is a, a, a complex system of layers and the physical body is just part of the vehicle for the soul, the spirit, the emotional life, etc. then it doesn't make any sense at all. And he's working diligently to try and wake people up to the fact that what they're doing over there is creating hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of children who are medicated rather yeah. than being taught about their life, their emotions, their relationships, their purpose in life, et cetera. Absolutely, Tim. And the sad thing is, is that it's good for business. What's good for business is rarely good for the human being. And I think this is, you know, and I, I got a doctor contacted me a while ago telling me her main clientele are suicidal psychiatrists. And, you know, these psychiatrists, they're human beings. They went into it with the best of intentions, I would like to believe, but they're trapped in a system. But who creates the system? You see, so it's, and the pharmaceutical companies and the insurance companies, we all know they're in each other's back pockets, so to speak. And recently a medical director, when I went to um, meet with, with them, you know, I walked in and stated the whole system is broken. And we are there pouring 
millions of dollars into a broken system. And it's politics. But like how many suicides, how many deaths do there need to be before we change? And that's what so concerns me. And if we, if we can somehow really acknowledge that the heart is not a pump, the brain is not a computer, and for people to understand the soul informs the brain. We know now the brain is very flexible. We're not victims. And, um, and if we can help people, but I think one element which is important to me, and we treat everyone who comes to Inner Fire, is we're creators and we're not victims. And so to recognize, and I think I probably mentioned this in the last podcast we had together, but to um, that, you know, it doesn't, no matter what has happened in life, there are opportunities for growth. And of course, the animal kingdom, so we're, we're human beings are part of their four kingdoms, we know the mineral, the plant, the animal and the human kingdom. And the animals can't, you know, a dog is not going to decide to become vegetarian for a month. Yeah, but just to say that the human being actually has a choice. And, you know, when individuals are not given the support that's needed for them to review their life and also appreciating that the past is reflected in the present, and what is the opportunity? for the challenges, you know, for me and working with the challenges, which is actually empowering, um, then it's really disheartening and the individuals, they're just told you have to take this medication, you're forcibly injected. And it's just such humiliations, there's such disrespect. Well, there's so much that comes from a program like yours where you're teaching people more about their mind, their body, their emotions, their thoughts, their, their, their spirit, their creativity. And these are the pieces we need to be awakened to so that we've got tools for getting through the challenges in life that aren't just take another pill. Yeah. And I'm, I'm hoping you can talk to us a little bit about the, um, the art therapy you do, the, the creative work you do with people and how you view that fitting into this therapeutic model. Yes, I will. Thank you, Tim. And so just to give the picture, so we work very consciously with what I call the fourfold human being, the physical body. So the diet to everything like that is very, very important. And during the morning, they do practical physical work. They chop down trees, they split wood, they learn how to cook properly, which will empower them for when they leave in our fire. They work in the garden, they sow the seeds, they plant them. And that's the sort of community work they do in the morning. Then in the afternoon, we know we can't be, so to speak, in the out breath all the time. So we have in the afternoon, you come to the in breath, where you do various different therapies. And I do, um, and so a very, so, well, I work with what's known as Hauschka artistic therapy. And it's referred to as artistic because it has to do with building up. It's not analyzing, diagnosing, taking apart, interpreting at all, but it's very much of a process. And so depending on the individual, we'll use different mediums. So first of all, you have to understand, get a sense for where the state of soul the individual is in. And just to, maybe I touched on this last time, but if one is stuck in the in-breath, if I saw something really awful and I get caught in that breath, well then I'm not gonna be working with that person with clay, but much more with watercolor. Maybe watercolor is too big a step to take where you're working with the living element of water and you have the beautiful luminosity of the color and the color blending to nourish the soul, to help the soul to breathe again. Maybe I would start with the pastel, which also you can blend and work with color, but it's tactile, you see. But if I have had a, a drug experience where I tipped into an out-of-body experience and I'm having a hard time getting back into my body 
And so that I would refer to as a real out breath where I've lost my center. If I was sexually abused, I'm gonna to wanna to get as far out of this body of pain as possible. But if I lose my center, then I'm going to hear voices, you see? And so in a situation like that, we would then work with clay because the, the principle is to help the individual get into their body, into their fingertips in a very practical, tactile way. And oftentimes with someone who's had been wrestling with that, with getting stuck in the out breath, when they first handle, well, this is actually, this is very interesting. What I have noticed is when people first arrive and many of them are medicated, um, and they can arrive shuffling their feet and blurry eyed and that sort of thing. It takes them ages, weeks and weeks to simply form a sphere. You know, wow. you're not allowed to roll it. They're very, so to speak, well behaved, you know, which is can be a concern. <laughs> but and it takes them a long time to bring that energy into their fingertips where they can shape something. Now, what's very interesting is as they taper, then they may not be quite so well behaved because they're feeling feelings and they're, they're dealing with anger, suppressed anger. And I see anger as really blocked creative energy. It's energy that should be flowing, but it's, it's been blocked. And so they're dealing and having to work with in a safe environment, emotions that come up. So they may be more challenging to work with, but really not really. But they can form the sphere in no time at all. And that's fascinating because they are more present, they're more mindful, they're able to be in their body. And that to me is like really very, very interesting. And they also say, I feel I can think again, you know, or I'm having these feelings or and the will. So we think of the soul forces as the ability to think clearly, to have heartfelt feelings, and to be able to do. That's those are what makes us a human being. And, and so when when you say you you use the word tapering, and so I'm assuming you mean tapering off of medications. Yeah. And so when yeah. you pull that numbing slowing down uh, mechanism out of the system there's more of a flow of energy and they get connected yeah head to heart to spirit and that's when they can work with the clay more efficiently yes it's so beautiful it really is a beautiful experience they come and they're sort of numbed i remember one man when he he hadn't been here very long and we were in the kitchen a few of us and he was sitting down he looked up at me and he said but you all are so compassionate. It's like, and the way he said it made me think, oh dear, where have you been? Yeah. Because actually we're not particularly, we're just human beings. Right. We just love and respect and believe in their healing process, you know? But, and so, and the beautiful thing about the artistic therapies, now, first of all, you have to get over the hurdle of, I can't do this and I'm no good. Right. And I'm left with the end result. So that's a valuable hurdle to get over where one is just simply in the process. And it's not an art class. So you don't have to worry about the end results, but it's a process. And, um, and what you're doing, what it dawned on me over the years, what I'm actually doing is helping them create with what I call their divine creative self. And there's the, there's, the, I, uh, there's the part of me that thinks, and I'll jolly well find it, whether it's through the clay, the watercolor, the pastel, or the charcoal, or whatever, you know? And it's like matchmaking. One of these mediums is going to really speak to them. And then you can, it's not mean, it doesn't mean it's gonna be easy. I mean, I've had people with clay in this process I described to you who really have said to me, I feel like throwing this through the window because all I'm trying to do is make a sphere and I can't make this bloom and sphere, you know, and they see it and it's hard. But what's so beautiful to see, Tim, is gradually their consciousness gets into their fingertips. They can feel the clay beneath their thumb. They can make it do what they want it to do. And the clay is very forgiving. 
And then what we would do is from the clay, then we go to whittling. So everyone whittles the spoons or other items like this. And the beauty is the wood is a little bit less forgiving. You do too much, you can't just mush it back together again the way you can with clay. And eventually to stone carving. And so each of them strengthens this will. I want to do this and I make it possible for myself to do this. And that's this will which has been so suppressed because of various different substances as well as these psychotropic meds. And what strikes me is you're talking about giving them exercises that strengthen their ability to stay connected. Yeah. And, and have all of their senses and the head and the heart and the spirit working, which, you know, in so much in our world has been basically conditioned out of us. Yeah. And, and we just focus on the head. Just totally. focus on the thoughts. Just focus on the thoughts. <laughs> I know, and Tim, this may be a terribly politically incorrect thing to say, but we're so head oriented in this country that I would say we're a fairly psychotic country actually as people head that psychosis is when we get stuck in our heads and our heads anyway are sitting on our shoulders you know so it's not really we're not in our organism in the same way but the what we refer to as mania and having these ideas that are just lifting us further and further away from being grounded and so and these poor but it starts at such an early age you know children from the age of even kindergarten, Tim, they're having to sit down behind desks. Yeah, yeah, it's, so it's they're not able to be children and run and climb trees because they could fall, and then you're you're crippled by the insurance and liability. I mean, we're it's a very unpeople centered country. I'm afraid we live in now, but but yeah, and I've had I remember one time with a woman who was um, hearing voices and you know a fairly fairly what would be referred to as paranoid, afraid that everyone can read her thoughts and so on and so on. And we were doing something called form drawing on, we have a, a board that, a, a green board that stands on the side of a barn here, where so we're outdoors with nature around us and we're doing particular forms, repetitive forms on the board to build up the whole etheric, the whole rhythm and order. And at the end of the session, I asked her, have you heard, have you heard voices during this time? And she paused and she looked at me and said, not at all. And it was such an experience for her because she was under the fearful state of feeling she was going to have to hear voices the rest of her life. But if you get into your body, to get out of your head, into your body, and that's really, that's referred to as a will-based intelligence, Tim. So inner fire is all about getting grounded, getting into your body. As, as you know, from the previous interview, we do a lot of practical physical work here, but then you need to nourish the soul. And that's what the artistic therapies and other therapies in the afternoons are about. Well, and you know, I've had the pleasure of interviewing a number of people for the On Your Mind podcast over the past two years. And one of them, I believe her name was Kathy Adams. She's working with the, the population, the late teen, early 20s population who have psychotic episodes. And it's a known thing that a certain percentage of us as humans are going to go through that during that turbulent period with all the hormones and the social changes and the societal expectations. And th there's solid research that says directly in contrast to what many psychiatrists are taught in their training, when you have a psychotic episode, it doesn't mean you are now schizophrenic. Yeah. You, you are now bipolar and you have this lifelong, it doesn't mean that. It means there's been a shift in your perceptual field and you don't know how to deal with it. And when they, and there's solid research, this isn't just wishful thinking that when you get early intervention for those people, the incidence of repeat episodes of psychosis and long-term prognosis change dramatically. Yeah. Then if you are just given a medication and given a label and told, oh, 
you're one of those unfortunate few who are schizophrenic and this is your lifetime label and here's your diagnosis and here are the meds you have to take the rest of your life. That tends to produce more and more psychotic episodes, more and more uh, debilitation in the person. Whereas on a regular basis, when people are that young, they're 17, 18, 20, 24 years old, they have a psychotic break meaning they hear voices, they're seeing things nobody else sees, they're stuck in, inside themselves. If they get an early intervention, if they get plugged into family and community resources, if they're given things to do other than just take a medication, yeah. lo and behold, they emerge on the other side of that. And many don't have a second, third, fourth, or fifth. Exactly. And go on to lead a productive life with this little yep. episode in their past that they grew from. Absolutely. But in addition, Tim, these episodes are happening more and more often. And I think because of how life is, where it is so head oriented, people don't know what to do. They're, they're, many people have lived their first 21 years, never climbing a tree, hardly doing anything with their hands. So the tendency toward a psychotic episode is much higher than when we were children. You know, the lifestyle has changed and we have to realize how imbalanced the lifestyle is. Plus, of course, the substances are reaching marijuana being legalized and that's a huge concern of, um, you know, the whole issue without going into the whole ethical question, but it's a huge concern because it's reaching our, young, our people younger and younger, and it also disconnects us from our will. You know, it's not as dangerous as people say as alcohol, but it's certainly undermining many of the people who are, who've been here at Inner Fire. They started innocently with marijuana. Well, you know? and the other thing is that the younger a person is introduced to whether it's alcohol or marijuana or whatever yeah. else it's affecting the development of their young brain absolutely and uh you know dr daniel amen is just one of many people who are studying this now and saying look this stuff affects the brain development every bit as much as trauma you know you've you've got uh gabor mate who does work and he's his research on how the trauma affects the developing brain yeah. and they can see it well the same thing is happening if we're too young and we get introduced to these chemicals that change the brain functioning. And as you say, it's happening in the context of us not being active, physically connected, mentally and emotionally, being outdoors, feeling our sense of agency. Yeah. And then also, you know, that we can actually give somebody a medication, I mean, ethically, you know, doctors have this vow, do no harm. Can you really ethically give somebody a medication which side effects are suicidal ideations, danger to yourself or others, insomnia, and we know if we don't get enough sleep, that can lead to mania. The quality of food, I mean, I mean, they can be really very, as, as one elderly friend said to me one time years ago, what sensitive thoughtful person would not be depressed you know when you look at the state but nevertheless we're creators and we can work with these challenges we're here for a reason and we all need to bring change and to claim our voice and to speak up you know and do it find our colleagues and do what we can to to bring the change that's so needed you know well and and to spread the the, the message get the word out there that if you know somebody who's having a psychotic episode, the answer is not just take some meds and get thrown in the hospital. Yeah. Well, you know, in, in, in the throes of an intense episode, that might be good to keep people safe, but it's certainly not the answer. No. And, you know, the, you, you mentioned the sleep deprivation, which is one of the biggest things that Jim Gottstein is an attorney in Alaska, and he's now an advocate for mental health issues because he got a law degree from Harvard and went out and was practicing law as a young guy, and he's got a degree from Harvard, and he's just all gung-ho, and he's working on a case, 
and he stays up real late two or three or four nights in a row. And now there's a right, the case is ready to be presented. So he does, pulls an all nighter. The next thing you know, he has a psychotic episode and yeah. he's, he's walking around outside naked or pounding on somebody's door that is in his house or whatever. And he ends up in a hospital drugged up. Yeah. And when he's in the hospital, the people in the hospital think, oh, this guy is psychotic. And he tells them as he's coming out of the fog, well, no, I'm an attorney. Yeah. Oh, sure you are. Sure you are. And they pat him oh, on the head. Dear. Oh, sure you are. Oh, and no, no, dear. not only that, but I went to Harvard. Oh, yeah, sure. Doctor from Harvard. Okay, that's good. And they won't even listen. I know. Even though the facts of the matter are he's telling the truth. He's, he's found clarity now. He's no longer psychotic. And they wouldn't believe him. Yeah. He had to stumble across a psychiatrist who took the time to hear his story and said, well, wait a minute, anybody who goes without sleep for four or five days might have a psychotic episode. So what we need to do is help you get some decent sleep and take you off of this other medication. And that happens very often. And all too few times do you stumble across somebody who understands the role of the balance as you're talking about the sleep, the nutrition, the connection to your body, the head, the heart, the spirit. But when, when you know those pieces and be give, giving the tools to people, it doesn't turn into a lifetime of suffering. It turns into a wonderful creative life. Yeah, yeah. And you know, there's these terms, if you want to really think about them, you know, when you think of bipolar, so what's bipolar? Bipolar is typically when you think about something and then the next thing you know, you're doing it. It's one extreme or the other, but you're missing the feeling realm, you see? So we all are thinkers, feelers, and doers. Now, some of us are more thinkers and feelers, but we don't do. And when, we, the, when the will is weaker, we can see I need to balance this, I need to strengthen this in myself. So if I'm just a thinker and a feeler, then not a lot gets done, right? Now, if I'm a thinker and a doer without the feeling, without the heart, that's dangerous. A lot of things get done that way that would never happen if you felt. Now, if you're a feeler and a doer, but you don't think, then that's, there's chaos. You know, and for many, many years, I worked in prisons and a lot of remarkable, beautiful, fine, fine human beings are behind bars. And as you get to know them, you realize that they either thought and did without feeling, or they felt and did without thinking. They reacted. And and this is then what happens, but we can always work. All of us can work. We're, we're all seekers, we're all growers. We can always work on balancing and learning ourselves. And that's the beautiful thing about human beings, what we can do. But um, well, let me just, this let me... bipolar picture is, well, you don't have the feelings. Well, I, I wanna come back to what you were just saying because Everyone I know who's ever worked in the prison system from a holistic perspective, viewing people with respect, yeah. they come out and they say almost exactly what you say. There are wonderful, beautiful, creative, loving, respectful people in there. Yeah. Now, this isn't all of them, but many of them are. And as a culture, I know I was taught to think that if you did something and landed in jail or prison, you were not the same as the rest of us. You didn't deserve any rights or respect, and you deserved what you got. And you were so wounded. Basically, you were an animal, not a human. And I remember being taught that as a, as a young person and a young adult. And I remember thinking of it that way, moving into my experience in college. And then I started working as a volunteer in probation and I started discovering, well, that's not true. These are just people just like me. I know. They fall on rough times. 
they were raised in abusive households. This is all they know how to do. And when you give them other options, they start responding differently. Of course, Tim. And that's why, you know, I loved, I used to say to the guys, I used to say, you all want to get out of here. I love coming in. And I would go in with um, alternatives to violence project. And which is now started out of after the Attica rebellion. Some of the in, some of the inmates were then sent to another prison in New York, and um, it was it was totally remarkable, totally remarkable. And there were times where I thought, oh goodness, you know, if I had that situation, what would I have done? And I remember one man saying to me, nope. I still had a choice and I made the wrong choice. And I thought, you're remarkable. You know, there are people who have, but in our country, Tim, you know, I'm sorry to say, but I think we're so archaic in the sense that we still believe you are your crime and you're never going to change, which is so, so wrong. It's so Old Testament stuck. It has nothing to do with with recognizing the creator and the individual and that we can move forward. And everybody, as you've mentioned a couple of times, everybody has their story. Now, if they can realize their opportunities in these stories for growth, I don't have to stay a victim. You know, the animal can't change. So we, and we all have the animal in us, you know, but we can choose and to think differently about our life situation when we grow to understand it more but as long as we medicate you know which is good for business and has nothing to do with really what's best for the human being well then people just get stuck but they don't need to be stuck and the we get trained to think and believe in a certain way like i was saying all the way up until i started working in the uh, probation field when I was in college I thought man if you went to jail it was all your fault and that means you're not you know you're you're this far away from being non-human and and, um, when I think about the attitude that so many of our law enforcement people have and I understand Dr. Gilmartin wrote a book you know emotional survival for law enforcement where he talks about how almost everybody who works in law enforcement or as a first responder, as a paramedic or a fireman, fire person, that these people have been faced with trauma after trauma after trauma, and they're not given the tools to deal with it any more than the people who are thrown in the psychiatric hospital or the people who are thrown in the prisons. Mm -hmm. So, So as you mentioned in the beginning, it's a system that's broken. Totally, Tim. And also find out, for instance, I was speaking with someone recently who um, became a nurse, had very wonderful ideals. When he got on the ward and he saw how many pills were being popped by the nurses in order to maintain the crazy responsibilities, the uh, schedule, the, overwork, the schedule. And I mean, he had, a, he had a kind of a breakdown in a way. He couldn't believe and they were forced to not be honest. And I mean, how many law enforcement officers, in order to do what they do, what medications are they on? Well, even- now you have to you have to really look and see where is the human being. I mean, we always say to our seekers here at Inner Fire, there's you, and then there's you that's trying to deal with the side effects of tapering slowly and carefully off your meds. Now that's not the same. The essence is there, but you are dealing with a heck of a lot of stuff while 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 engaged in your healing journey, really. I remember one uh, gentleman that I was trained by. He was in Florida back in the time when cocaine was just, it was like water in Florida. And he said he got so tired of dealing with these people who they would come in, they'd pull them out of the gutter near death, you know, hospitalize them, medical attention, clean them up, get them a shower. And then they, they, with three or four days clean without that stuff pumping through their system, they would bounce back so quickly 
Yeah. They get a shower and a shave and they and they'd be sitting in his office saying, you know, I think I can handle this on my own. He got so tired of that. He kept a box of x lax in his drawer and he would pull it out and throw it in the center of his desk. And he said, if you're so certain that you can control the effects of chemicals once you put them in your body, you eat half that box of x lax and I'll eat the other half and we'll see who has to use the bathroom first. <laughs> oh, dear. Right. Yeah. Those yeah. drugs that we're taking, and I, I'd like to, you know, encourage you to quit using the word side in the middle of this talk about effects, the effects yeah. of the drugs people take, yeah. the ones they want, and the ones they don't want are an effect of the drug they take. And when you've been on a medication that changes the flow of the neurotransmitters in your brain, it changes your hormone production and balance, it changes it, that's an effect of that medication. And you're going to have effects as your system tries to rebound and balance out. There's this thing we call homeostasis and balance. You're going to have effects when you taper off or stop completely or whatever. It's just the effects. Yeah. And you know, I had a beautiful experience the other day when one of our seekers came to talk to me, who's just beginning the tape, his tapering process. And it has happened before, but every time it's just beautiful, I find. And um, after lunch, they, they get liver compresses and then there's a rest and then the afternoon begins and the person was sharing how when they lie down, the thoughts start racing in their heads, you know, and he came and they came down and was very, was very concerned and what shall I do and our theme song at Inner Fire is stay engaged. So I knew what his plans were going to be for the afternoon. So I spoke with one of the um the outdoor guide about make sure he's willfully engaged make sure he's doing this or that you know that sort of thing and then the next three hours they would he was with different therapists you know and at the end of the day when he and i were working together and i checked in how are you doing he said i'm doing so much better he said staying engaged is really the answer not sort of sitting and but so many people don't have the opportunity tim so many people, they're in their bedsit or their apartment or they're, they're alone. They're not in community. And, um, and that's really tough. But it's beautiful to see, get in your will, come down, come down. But then, of course, the humbling thing is, Tim, is you can't make anyone do anything. So he was right. very open to it. He stayed engaged. We can encourage, we can cajole and support. But if the person... You know, I mean, we had one seeker once who said mania is so much more exciting than real life. And I thought, oh, my God, we're trying so hard to support you. But if you're really happier in mania, well, then we shouldn't make such an effort. You know, of course we did. But well, and then there's the other side of it, which is that in a number of different cultures, historically, this thing that we're calling mental illness or a psychotic episode or mania is a part of a spiritual path or process or growth or tool. And so if you're dealing with somebody who doesn't want to give it up, you, yeah. as, you just, as you just said, you can't make them. And it might be useful if we had the ability to develop more of these resources to direct them towards somebody who could say, okay, well, let's have you explore how this might be part of your spiritual path? Because in a different culture, you might become the shaman. Exactly, exactly. And people do have beautiful experiences which they can express and share. You can, seekers know they can talk about anything at Inner Fire. And we have remarkable conversations and people more and more are having spiritual experiences, Tim, that they're not quite sure what to do about, you know, but they can, they can see how they're that these experiences are important but they have to be grounded that's the thing and to have these these out-of-body experiences if you you can have them if you're if you're really on a spiritual path and you've prepared yourself and you're working in that way totally fine what's very difficult is when people have these experiences and you're not in a society that accepts it and acknowledges it and they don't have a guide. And you don't have a guide. And you can't no. turn it into something that becomes a growth experience and transformational. Then it just is that loop of 
pain and suffering. Yeah, and people are afraid. Well, if we take a look and and notice the time and say, okay, so we're we're getting close. We need to wind down here. What's something that you want to share with us that maybe we haven't touched on yet that you were hoping to get into this talk? Yeah, Tim, what I touched on just a moment ago was that so many people are alone in this process. And um, at Inner Fire, you know, my greatest heartache, to be honest, is the tuition of Inner Fire. And we need, if for Inner Fire to be what it needs to be, it has to be available for people regardless of their race, their religion, their financial situation, whatever they've been in. If you really want to be proactive in your healing journey, then you should be able to come to Inner Fire. But we live in a country where insurance, of course, you know, wants you to be fixed and sort out your life in three weeks time or three months at the most. Inner Fire is typically a year program. And I'm so relieved that we can have people come slowly, carefully off their medication so they really can reclaim their lives. Now we have what we call a supporter seeker fund and we've always been able to support somebody, you know, people over the years with minimal cost, but we can't do that with everybody. And so somewhere we have to find a way outside the box to, to attract donors or people who've gone through this or have loved ones who've gone through this so that we can create a fund which can help people who really want to be proactive. And so that's one thing I'd like to just, just mention is that we're, we're sort of stuck. For the first six years of Inner Fire, I didn't take an income because it makes it easier for me to ask others if they can give, you know. But, you know, we've got wonderful guides here who work so hard. Of course, they need an income. And then we, you know, and so on. So we keep it as minimal as possible, but it's still a lot. So, and, so what would someone do to be able to, let's say somebody had some money and they wanted to donate to this, would you call it support a seeker fund? Yeah, yeah. Well, they could contact me at beatrice.innerfire at gmail.com. And, um, or that's probably the best way to do it. Or on our website, innerfire.us is our address. But anything. Is there, it, is there a donate button on the website? We don't have that on our website. Well, um, I guess we could. <laughs> we should. It's, that's a very good idea. A lot of people you know, who might hear this might say, hey, you know, I've got a little extra money and I, I, I went through that or I had a son or daughter who went through that and I'd like to support this. So yeah, we'll um, do that. You're not the first who's mentioned it. We'll, we'll do that. And maybe I'll just say this one other thing, which I think is really important, Tim, is um, I was once asked, well, how, how do you know when someone's ready to leave Inner Fire? And, you know, and I also got a phone call a little while ago, somebody phoning about his sister and saying, um, what's the proof that you can fix my sister? And I said, there's no proof. It's teamwork. This is this not a machine. We're not working with machines. Now, I would say what, um, what my aim is for the seekers who come here is if we can help them connect with what I call the divine creative self, the part that's unwounded, then when they leave inner fire, you know, they may have, we can't promise you'll never have challenges again in your life. I mean, that's ridiculous, you know, because life is about challenges and growing and learning, you know, but if they've connected with that part of themselves, then really you can work with any challenge that comes your way because you know, it belongs to you. There's an opportunity in it. And I, and I think trauma has a lot to do with him when we don't learn from this or that experience that we've gone through why did i need that experience what's the opportunity in it so it doesn't happen again then it's very hard to digest trauma until we've learned and then we can let it go i think it's a little bit more complicated than that but the gist is and i think um the gist is things don't happen just by chance and we can think why does this happen to me again and again, and it's like, well, am I learning? Am I learning? Why? What's blocking me from learning in that way? So I think 
those two points. One is inner fire has to be available for people regardless of their financial situation. And anyone who can help us, with, well, I would be so incredibly grateful because I, I, hate, I hate it when people say, well, how much does it cost? And I have to mention it, it's like, you know, and it's wrong. It's just ethically wrong. But this is the system we're in also. Well, you know? I greatly appreciate it. I thank you for spending the time with us. And uh, I look forward to checking in again. I remember two years ago, I said, I'll check in in a year. And I don't know, I don't know what happened. I don't know how it got to be two years. <laughs> Time goes very quickly. It certainly yeah. did. But yeah. it's, a, it's a blessing to have you join us. Thank you. I'm honored. And I look forward to the next time we get to talk. Thank you, Tim. And thank you for all the beautiful work you're doing and the wonderful people you're interviewing and helping what they're doing spread. Yeah. You're okay. welcome and deserving. Okay, thank you, Tim. Bye-bye. Beatrice Birch is the founder, ED, and director of the therapeutic program of the Inner Fire Proactive Healing Community in Vermont. She has worked as a Huska artistic therapist for more than 30 years in integrative clinics and in inspiring initiatives in England, Holland, and the United States, where the whole human being of body, soul, and spirit was recognized and embraced in the healing process. She has lectured and taught as far afield as Taiwan. Her passionate belief in both the creative spirit within everyone and the importance of choice, along with her love and interest in the human being, has taken her also into prisons where she has volunteered for many years, offering soul support through alternatives to violence work and watercolor painting. Please note, Beatrice was first interviewed for the On Your Mind podcast, and it was published on April 7th, 2020. Please reference that for more information about the Interfire Proactive Healing Community. As in this episode, we will focus more on Beatrice as a therapist and her philosophy of dealing with the whole human being. You've been listening to the On Your Mind podcast, offered by Journey's Dream where we support people through mental health challenges to a place of true and lasting well-being. If you love our show, we invite you to visit onyourmindpodcast.org to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our helpful resources. Thank you for listening.